We'll start with a, a prayer, and this is um, a prayer from the conclusion of Deus Caritas Est. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Holy Mary, Mother of God, you have given the world its true light. Jesus, your Son, the Son of God, you abandoned yourself completely to God's call, and thus became a wellspring of the goodness which flows forth from him. Show us Jesus, lead us to him, teach us to know and love him, so that we too can become capable of true love and be fountains of living water in the midst of a thirsting world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you for uh, joining me tonight for this last uh, talk for the summer catechesis. Um, so we'll be completing our talks with uh, Popes uh, Benedict XVI and, and Francis. Um, there's kind of that... Um, I don't know, caution or caveat that um, these are obviously very recent documents, uh, and especially those from Pope Francis. And so we don't really know the full impact of them. And so that's why I'm not going to go into them in great detail, because, you know, it's still kind of being, uh, you know, evaluated and, and what, what does it mean for us? Uh, and so that's why there's really just the one that I'm going to go into a little bit more de detail. Uh, and then the rest, just to kind of like an overview so that you know uh, what the recent popes have been saying. Um, and so we'll, we'll start with uh, Pope Benedict XVI. Um, you can see there. Uh, he was born Joseph Ratzinger on April 16th, 1927 in Bavaria, uh, in what is now Germany, and then it was the Weimar Republic. Um, has a, an interesting story of his life during World War II, which I won't get into now, uh, but he was ordained a priest on uh, June 29th, 1951, um, worked for a long time as a professor, uh, and a very highly, highly educated, um, extremely intelligent, um, and was then named uh, Archbishop Cardinal of the Diocese of Munich and Freising on June 27, 1977. Uh, and he was elevated to, the, uh, to Rome to the prefect of the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith, uh, where, which was his position from 1982 until uh, 2005, so under the, uh, the papacy of John Paul II. Um, and basically that what that means is the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith is the main body that defends the Catholic doctrine. So any questions about Catholic doctrine that come to Rome come to the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith. And so that was his main post uh, for, uh, what, 17 years? Uh, and that's where he kind of got his reputation as the, um, was it the Bulldog? Um, the uh, uh, main uh, defender of the faith for the, the church. Uh, and then, of course, he was elected pope, uh, replacing John Paul II, April 19th, 2005. Uh, and he resigned a little bit less than eight years later on February 28th, 2013. Uh, he was the first pope to resign since uh, Gregory XII in 1415, uh, which was part of the Western Schism, if you know anything about church history. Uh, he resigned to end the Schism so that there would be only one pope. There were three at that time. Um, but he was the first pope to, re to resign on his own initiative since uh, Celestine V in 1294. Um, so very um, unusual for the pope to resign. And of course, uh, you know, all of that came out of that. Um, which I won't get into, that's beyond what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and like I said, very educated, um, wrote a lot of books, uh, wrote on basically any major theological topic you could think of, um, and uh, many writings uh, as priest, bishop, cardinal, uh, and then even as the Pope, he wrote some things still as Joseph Ratzinger. Uh, most famously, the uh, three-volume uh, 
trilogy uh, called Jesus of Nazareth, um, kind of looking, walking through the life of Jesus. Uh, and it, he wrote that, again, as Pope, well, when he was Pope, but he didn't write it as Pope. He wrote it um, as a scholar uh, to kind of distinguish it as, you know, this is a work of scholarship, not a work of um, the magisterium, the work of the church. Um, and what's interesting, so for me personally, when I uh, entered the seminary, I kind of had the, the view of Pope Benedict um, that the media presented, which was a um, cold, hard, um, the watchdog of the faith, the, um, the person who had no heart, um, and was just kind of a very kind of robotic um, theologian. Uh, but through seminary, I read a lot of what he did. And I'll be honest, he's my favorite theologian. I've read most of what he has written, and I wrote my thesis based on his theology. And I grew to love him and to understand that he is a very, um, uh, very knowledgeable, yes, but he also has a lot of heart uh, and is very much in the line of St. Augustine um, of kind of bringing the heart into theology. And so I think he's very much under misunderstood by those who don't actually read him uh, and don't take the... Um, initiative to understand it beyond what the secular media wants to present him as. And so I just, uh, per, you know, kind of give that as my background of, of, of uh, Benedict and his theology. Um, and would invite you, if you haven't read any of his works, to read um, probably the best way to start, maybe besides the John, Jesus of Nazareth trilogy, is uh, his book, uh, Introduction to Christianity which gives a good kind of overview of different uh, Christian theology and uh, also gives you good insight into his theology. Um, so introduction to Christianity is probably the best place to start with him. Um, but anyways, uh, beyond the person, let's talk about uh, his writing. So he has, he wrote three uh, encyclicals as Pope. Um, two of them on the theological virtues, uh, and he was going to write a third, uh, but he resigned before it was finished, and we'll see that Pope Francis kind of finished it. Uh, so the first of those is Deus Caritas S, uh, which means God is love, and it was promulgated on December 25th, Christmas of course, 2005. Um, note there that it was very soon after he was uh, elected Pope, and so some of it is based on the writings of John Paul II. That he, John Paul II had kind of started this in a way, and Pope Benedict picked it up and uh, finished it. So most of it is Benedict, but there are parts of it uh, that are very clearly John Paul II, uh, and certainly influenced by him. The main idea of David's Caritas is, is to look at love from the Christian perspective. And of course, the Christian perspective is that God is at the center. Um, and so that's how the, that's what this is looking at. And again, it's the first of three theological virtues that are covered in the encyclicals. Um, so this would be love or charity. Um, charity means love, by the way, if you don't know. Um, it's the same root word, or same Latin word, car caritas. It can be translated either charity or love. Um, and another part kind of like overview of this, or our main ideas, is, is uh, based on the idea or the truth that God is love. And if God is love, then that is the image of mankind and the destiny of mankind. That the image of mankind is love, God's love. And the destiny of mankind is God's love. And so that's kind of what this is presenting. Uh, and he says in the first paragraph, being Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon in a decisive direction. Uh, and so that's something to, that's really important for us to remember, is that being Christian means having an encounter with Christ. And if we don't have that encounter with Christ, 
it's really hard to be Christian. Uh, we need to have that encounter with him and that relationship with him to be fully Christian and to fully live out that Christianity because without it, then we're kind of like lost. Uh, we need that relationship and that encounter with Christ to be truly Christian. Um, there are two parts of this encyclical. The first part is looking at the love of God, which he lavishes upon us. And the second part, uh, which is more of the, the JP2 part of it, is uh, our sharing it with others, our sharing God's love with others, how we do that uh, as a church. And so he starts with um, the first part looks at the three forms of love in Greek philosophy. Um, that would be eros, agape, and philia. Now what's interesting is that if you read C.S. Lewis, he talks about the four loves, the four loves in Greek philosophy. And I'm not sure where that difference is. I, I haven't been able to figure out where that difference is. But the fourth love that C.S. Lewis talks about that isn't in this is uh, what's called storge. Um, so that would be uh, like familial love, affection, the love of a mother for a child. Um, eros is, of course, um, it's usually broken down to sexual love, although that's not really what it is. It's, that's kind of the perversion of it, is lust, is the perversion of eros. Uh, but it starts with kind of that sexual or physical love, uh, but it's more than that, and that's what he talks about. Agape is God's love. It is a full love. It is a, a sacrificial love. It is giving of oneself for the other. It's, it's the fullness of love. And then philia would be like brotherly love. Um, the love of, of, of one for a friend or a brother. Um, and so there are different types of love in Greek philosophy. And I've talked about this in homilies, but it's that... Um, and he talks about it in here. Uh, the unfortunate reality that, uh, especially in modern times, love has been kind of uh, skewed and we don't really think about love in these different ways, but it's important to, to understand these different types of love to understand God and his relationship with us. Um, he talks about how agape is the most frequently used uh, type of love in sacred scripture. And that's extremely unique, that actually outside of sacred scripture, agape is rarely ever used. So that's why agape love is very closely related with God, because that's how, how we know it, is through sacred scripture, and through the reality of Jesus Christ as, as human. Um, and he talks about this important connection between love and the divine. And because there is a connection between love and the divine, Love promises, in, this is a quote, love promises infinity, eternity, a reality far greater and totally other than our everyday experience. Uh, and again, that's where our relationship and our encounter with Christ and with God is so important because we then understand that love goes beyond just this, what we see and what we sense. Uh, that love uh, reaches beyond that to eternity and it points to a greater reality beyond just this everyday experience. Uh, he talks in here about how agape love purifies eros, uh, that both are inherently good, but eros becomes just sex if there is no Christian spirituality attached to it. Uh, it becomes, and again, like I said, the corruption of it is lust. Uh, and so we don't want that corruption of arrows. We want it to be purified through the agape, through the love of God. Um, and he also talks about how the unfortunate thing is that because of that corruption, some Christian traditions view arrows as always a vice. But Catholic, the Catholicism never sees that. Catholicism sees the beauty of arrows, the beauty of that physical love between a man and a woman uh, who are married. Uh, Spousal love is a beautiful thing, but because of our imperfections, our fallenness, our fallen nature, um, that corruption comes in, and then some Christian traditions have seen it as a vice. Uh, but rather, there are distinct types of love. 
Uh, agape and eros are distinct types of love. Uh, and he says that they are separate halves of a complete whole. That agape and eros together make the, the whole, uh, the, the perfection of love that is God. It's the giving and the receiving. Agape being the giving, uh, eros being the receiving. Um, and so the two of them are needed for the per perfection of love. And that perfection is Christ. That Christ is the perfection of God's love. And then he poses this, in, this very important question that I think we all need to ponder, which is, can you love that which you have never seen? Because a lot of people tend to think, you know, love is so connected with the senses. And so you can only love something that you've seen. Um, and, and, but what he is saying is that no, love goes beyond just our senses. Uh, we can love God through the love of our neighbor. So by loving our neighbor, we love God, and that's how we get to move beyond just the senses with love. And we love God, we love our neighbor through Jesus. And he uses Mother Teresa here as an example of that love of neighbor uh, and that true sense of love, uh, for loving those who are most vulnerable, those who are most um, in need of God's love. Um, and Mother Teresa is such a great example. And it's interesting that when he was writing this, um, Mother Teresa had not been named a saint yet, but yet he talks about Mother Teresa as a saint. So he's kind of like hinting toward, you know, saying kind of by public opinion, by, by public acceptance, we know that Mother Teresa is a saint, even if she hasn't been formally named it by the church at that time. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing that he does in there. Any questions about that first part? So then the second part is, how do we show this love to others as the church? Uh, and he talks about how our charitable activities are so important for us as a church to express God's love for others. Um, and of course, we, we should know that the church, the Catholic Church, is the uh, largest um, charitable organization in the world. Um, and again, it's because of our understanding of who we are as a church and, and who God is, uh, that, that spreading that love to others. He talks about the threefold responsibility of the church. And so these are the three uh, Latin terms that he uses, uh, charisma, liturgia, and diacona. Uh, charisma is the proclaiming, is proclaiming the word of God. And we do that, yes, by literally proclaiming it, by reading uh, the scripture. But we also do it by proclaiming the word of God by our actions. Um, so, and then the second liturgia would be the sacraments. And then third, diacona, which is the ministry of charity, um, which is why deacons are called deacons. It comes from the Latin word diaconum, which means charity. Uh, it means service. And so deacons are called to be uh, the, particularly the purveyors of service to others. And I just had to, had to kind of think as I was preparing for today how uh, interesting that I would talk about diacona on the feast day of uh, St. Lawrence, who was the great deacon, uh, who, uh, deacon martyr, um, so just kind of interesting that that worked out. So again, the threefold responsibility of the church, proclaiming the word of God, the sacraments, providing the sacraments, and uh, ministries of charity. And he talks about how while the church is a family, our charity reaches beyond our family. And so he's presenting this as the example of what we should do in our own families, that just as the church reaches beyond the family of the church to provide for others. So our family, yes, we focus on our family first, but then we also need to move beyond just our family to provide charity and love, which is, of course, love for others. Um, he has a section in here talking about how social justice is the responsibility of politics and the laity, but the church informs the debate of social justice and it's guided by faith and reason so another again 
social justice should come from the government and from the people, but the church informs how that social justice uh, is works, how uh, through faith and reason, how that social justice should be uh, provided to other people. And in a lot of ways here, he, he or he, he does, he points back to Rerum Navarro and uh, the other uh, documents that came out from the church afterwards that uh, continued the um, tradition of Rerum Navarro in social justice. And I'm going to read a, a, a lengthy quote here. This is from paragraph 21. He says, The church cannot and must not take upon herself the political battle to bring about the most just society possible. She cannot and must not replace the state. Yet, at the same time, she cannot and must not remain on the sidelines in the fight for justice. She has to play her part through rational argument and she has to reawaken the spiritual energy, energy without which justice, which always defend, demands sacrifice, cannot prevail and prosper. A just society must be an achievement of politics, not of the church. Yet the promotion of justice through efforts to bring about openness of mind and will to the demands of the common good is something which concerns the church deeply. So again, uh, the importance of the state, of the government, to provide that just system for the people, um, and that the, the church has to be there to kind of help guide it along. But isn't the church isn't the state, and the state isn't the church. Uh, they have to work together to provide a just society. He, and so, kind of moving along with that, he talks about how we must conduct charity devoid of party and ideological influence. Uh, and a quote from, me, from paragraph 31, he says, Christian charitable activity must be independent of parties and ideologies. Again, it's that important separation of church and state that we provide uh, social justice, we provide charitable act activity, but not through a particular party or a particular ideological uh, lens, that we do it because it is the Christian thing to do. And so we have to make sure that when we are doing charitable things, it's not through um, a particular party or because or through a particular ideology. It's just as uh, a Christian endeavor. And along those lines, he says that charity also means uh, to not proselytize. In other words, not to forcefully evangelize through our charitable efforts. Yes, through our charitable efforts, we should be um, helping guide people to God, but never forcefully. Not to say, so we can't say, in order to receive this charity, you have to do this or that. Um, we provide charity um, to anybody, uh, regardless of their uh, faith, um, because it's the right thing to do. And again, we hope that we can influence them, but we never force them to do something. And finally, um, kind of wrapping up the section, he encourages the cooperation between the church, the state, and charitable organizations to provide that uh, charity and, and justice to all people. Any questions about this part of Dave's card to assess? It shouldn't be surprising. Um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of uh, reinforcing what's already been said. Uh, but it's important to remember uh, that uh, distinction between church and state, but how they also need to work together. So if there aren't any other questions, we'll move on to the second encyclical, which is Space Ave. So space all by means saved in hope. And so this would be the second of the theological virtues, love and hope, or charity and hope. Uh, saved in hope, so this was uh, from November 30th, 20, 2007. And if we want to look at an overall kind of view of this, it's uh, looking at the connection between hope and redemption, or salvation. 
And it's really interesting, he starts off by using the story of St. Josephine Vaquita to show the hope that is found in Christian life. Uh, do you know the story of, of St. Josephine Vaquita? So she was um, an African woman um, in the late 19th century. Uh, she was kidnapped, um, sold into slavery, um, and sold a number of times. Uh, she's from Northern Africa. She was sold a number of times and eventually uh, came to a, uh, was bought by a, an Italian family uh, that brought her back to Italy and freed her. And, um, and through her um, experience with this family, she came into contact with uh, the Catholic faith because they were Catholic. Um, and eventually, basically, it's a longer story, but she eventually uh, was baptized and became a, uh, a religious sister herself and in Italy uh, worked to um, uh, help the poor in Italy. And, uh, she, and it's fascinating her story that uh, once she came into counter, encounter with Christ, she immediately forgave um, her uh, slave owners and uh, re because realizing that there's something greater and that um, they led her, even though they didn't intend to, but they led her to Christ. Um, and it's just a great story of forgiveness and um, her realizing the hope that comes through Christianity um, and her influence on other people, uh, her, her story's influence on other people. It's a, a great story. Um, he then goes on to contrast the revolution of Christ versus the political revolutionary figures in Roman history, like Spartacus and Barabbas and others, that um, these other political um, revolutionary figures were trying to do to break away from or influence Rome through um, violence, whereas Christ wanted to influence through uh, faith, hope, and love, through uh, the peace, and how much greater a revolution that was uh, versus the violent attempts at overthrow. And so he says that Christ brought an encounter with God, which is an encounter with hope, which is stronger than any political reason. So hope is so much stronger than any, any anything uh, political or any political um, revolutionary ideas. And kind of moving on from that, he rejects Marxism and liberation theology. Um, so as the uh, prefect of the Congregation of, uh, of uh, Faith, uh, under John Paul II, he had been the primary um, voice in the church against liberation theology because of its connection with atheist Marxism. And so he continues that um, and, uh, in this encyclical, talking about the um, dangers of liberation theology. If you don't know liberation theology, that's we can talk about that some other time. But um, it was a revolutionary concept um, that maybe sounded good, but again, because it had Marxist um, background, it was uh, condemned by the church. It was in Latin America, by the way. Um, and so he talks about how hope and redemption are linked due to faith. He says, faith is this, or no, he, he points to uh, the reading which we just had this past Sunday. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and proof of things not seen. And so faith helps us get from uh, just hope to, redemp to salvation, to redemption. Uh, and he talks about how eternal life is our hope. Uh, but it's not if we only see this life. So we can only have hope in eternal life if we recognize that there's something beyond this life. Uh, which is, of course, what Christ was uh, bringing to us, that hope of eternal life. And pointing us to something greater than this life itself. Uh, and he also writes about the relationship between faith and reason. Uh, again, kind of continuing what JP2 had been so strong on. And similar to JP2, he concludes the chapter uh, talking about Mary's star of hope. Uh, he had done that also with the Ignis Caritas says, uh, talking about Mary. So that's just a very brief overview. Uh, but again, it's 
that connection between hope and salvation, uh, which is Christ uh, in our faith. Any questions about this? Yes? One is you really, a yes or no answer is good, but okay. when you talk about liberation theology, yes. um, I do remember that from my childhood. Did that um, have any bearing on Vatican II? Um, did liberation theology have bearing on Vatican II? As far as I remember, it came after the Second Vatican. At least how it was full I would have to I would have to go back in my mind about when exactly it began, but certainly it blossomed after a second break. So I, I I don't know for sure when it started, but certainly its greatest influence was in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, then uh, the final, the third encyclical from uh, Benedict XVI was uh, Caritas and Veritate, which is charity and truth. And so this is kind of returning to love uh, and the importance of love, and especially the importance of love connected with truth. And so this is from uh, June 29th, 2009. And he talks about how love and truth are necessary for progress in the developments for the common good. Love and truth are necessary to progress in the developments for the common good. He reflects on uh, the economic and social issues of the time, um, but the church, he says, does not offer specific solutions to those issues. Um, we can provide um, suggestions and we can provide kind of best things through the church, but not specific so solutions to particular situations. And so he talks about um, uh, free market fundamentalism, uh, hunger, the environment, migration, sexual tourism, bioethics, relativism, energy, and population issues. Those are all of the uh, major issues that he kind of uh, at least, you know, hints about or, or, or talks a little bit about. And overall, he says that charity or love motivates us to the common good. In paragraph 7 he says, the more we strive to secure a common good corresponding to the real needs of our neighbors, the more effectively we love them. And so charity is central to the church's social doctrine, as he had mentioned in Deus Cartes, but it must be linked to the truth to do good. So in other words, charity is great, and charity in um, the Church's social doctrine was great, but it only is good if it is, uh, if it is tied to the truth, uh, which is God. And I think you could kind of say that that's where, uh, kind of getting at uh, the issues with liberation theology, which were um, uh, in some ways divorced from the truth of, of God. And he harkens back to uh, Pope Paul VI's encyclical Popularum Progress Progressio uh, from 1967, which itself was an update of Rerum Novarum. So that's something that I didn't get into too much in our talks, but Rerum Novarum was kind of the first uh, encyclical on social doctrine and social justice, and there were about a half a dozen others uh, written on the uh, anniversaries that kind of went back to it and kind of reinforced it. Um, and so it's just kind of like this, this line of encyclicals uh, over the last 150 years that are all pointing back to Rerum Novarum as uh, the document on social justice and social doctrines. And so because of that, uh, he points to the issues that were presented in those encyclicals like uh, a just wage, uh, the security of employment, uh, fair working conditions, unions, and the universal destination of goods. Again, all of these I talked about when I talked about Rerum Navarro. He doesn't say anything uh, radically different, it's just kind of reaffirming what had already been said. Uh, he does talk about the need to avoid excessive individualism uh, and that we must remember that we are part of a fraternity through God's love. And at the same time, 
He talks about the dangers of globalization, that there are some groups that are seeking profits for profit's sake and dismissing the human side. And so governments need to safeguard their people against this uh, tendency to uh, seek profit over human dignity. And he talks about the beauty of gratuity, that when we freely give, it's a beautiful thing, because giving fosters justice, responsibility, and a sense of the common good. And he also writes about um, the rights and duties of the individual and governments, um, and that between rights and duties, the latter should take precedence. Our, our duty to others takes precedence over uh, people's rights. Um, that sounds bad, but it's not. Um, he says that there's too much of a focus on individual rights, which leads to selfishness and promoting those rights to vices. So in other words, uh, we see this quite a bit today, that the focus is on the individual right, right, this is my right, we see this with abortion and other things, this is my individual right, but when we focus on what's my right versus what's good or what's the right of uh, human dignity and um, all peoples, then that leads to selfishness, and that leads to other vices. Rights are respected when everyone agrees to respect each other's rights. So in other words, our individual rights must be in line with the rights of other people. And that uh, the right to life, human dignity, always comes first over uh, particular individual rights. He also talks about the need to protect the environment, uh, to not hoard resources, uh, to, to remember that we are part of the human family and to live in cooperation, and that religion is the part of helping us to not live in isolation. Uh, so he's kind of, he's talking already now about how, um, especially modern man, our tendency is to become more and more isolated. But being part of a uh, faith and being part of religion helps us to get beyond ourselves and to be uh, even more part of something that's greater than ourselves. Helps, uh, helps us to fight against isolation, which is the tendency of modern man. And he kind of wraps up by saying that technology can be good, but we should not have a technocratic mindset. And technocratic means that our decisions are solely based on efficiency and technological progress. Uh, this was a, a major issue that started certainly in the early 20th century. Um, this is where me being a historian of technology is dangerous. Um, but the tendency to focus on efficiency and technological progress um, and not care about what that means for the individual, to the human. But as he's saying that, yes, technology can be good, but we always have to maintain uh, the focus on human dignity and the individual person, uh, and, and the person uh, over technology. So any questions on this encyclical? Again, just trying to give you a kind of a brief overview and um, encourage you if, if there's anything in here that is really important for you, or really interesting to you to look into it more. So let's talk a little bit about Pope Francis and his encyclicals. So Pope Francis um, was born Jorge Bergoglio, uh, December 17th, 1936 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And so when he was elected Pope, he was the first Jesuit Pope. He was the first Pope from the Americas and the first Pope from the Southern Hemisphere. He was also the first non-European Pope since Pope St. Gregory III in 741, uh, who was Syrian. So Europe, and especially Italy, had dominated the papacy for 
1200 years, 1300 years. Um, he was ordained a priest on December 13th, 1969. Interesting there, just four years, or four days before his birthday. Uh, he was consecrated to bishop in 1992. He became the Archbishop of Buenos Aires uh, from 1998 to 2013. Uh, elevated to a cardinal uh, February 21st, 2001, so under JP2. And he was elected Pope March 13th, 2013. So he, to this point, has written three encyclicals. And the first was Lumen Fide, or Light of Faith, uh, which was promulgated June 29th, 2013, as part of the Year of Faith. Now, if you're looking at those dates, yes, that was very quick. So he was elected Pope March 13th, and this um, was promulgated June 29th. So just a couple months later. Uh, the reason why is that a large part of this had been written by Benedict before he resigned, and um, Pope Francis then picked that up and uh, added to it and completed this. Uh, so this is kind of the, um, in a lot of ways, it's kind of, it's almost the fourth encyclical of ben Benedict, uh, but it was the, the third in uh, completing the uh, encyclicals on the theological virtues, so love, hope, and faith. And it starts by tracing the history of faith, starting with Abraham, uh, and kind of working through uh, the Bible and, and the major um, um, figures and, and faith history. Uh, it talks about the unity of faith and truth, and faith and reason, of course, because truth and reason are so closely connected. And he talks about the importance of the church and handing on the faith, which is what tradition is. It's handing on the faith. And he talks about how the sacraments are the key to handing on the faith throughout history. Uh, there's also a section here where it talks about faith in today's society. And then, like we had seen in uh, previous uh, encyclicals, recent encyclicals, he concludes with a paragraph or a, uh, a chapter on Mary as the example of faith. That's a very quick uh, introduction to this encyclical. But again, that's because it's so recent, a lot of it hasn't been um, studied uh, to a great extent so far. And uh, it, to be honest, uh, the unfortunate thing is that because of the other, the other two encyclicals have kind of um, overshadowed this one, and so this has kind of become a, a forgotten one in a lot of ways. Any questions? Very brief. That doesn't uh, talk about how brief the document is because it's not. It's something that if you ever sit down to read uh, encyclicals, uh, it really stands out. Um, and this is not a judgment, it's just a statement of reality that Pope Francis's encyclicals are significantly longer than anybody else's. And in fact, his apostolic letters, which are meant to be shorter, are longer than most encyclicals. So uh, it's interesting. It, it's just one of those interesting things. Again, it's not a, I'm not making a judgment here, but for somebody who really didn't write anything before he became Pope, his, his everything he's written since he's become Pope is much, much longer than anybody else's, and it's just, it's interesting how that kind of has worked out. So his second encyclical, this would be his first totally hymn, is Laudato Si, uh, from May 24th, 2015. Interestingly here, so uh, basically every other church document, the title is in Latin, uh, this one and the next one we'll see are Italian, not Latin. Um, so it means, praise be to you, 
and it is from St. Francis' Canticle of the Sun. So, just interesting that um, the first words are Italian, not Latin. Uh, this Laudato Si largely focuses on environmental issues. He critiques, among other things, uh, consumerism, uh, our throwaway culture, and unrestricted development. And this is really something uh, interesting to ponder and I think really important for us to think about. He talks about how the larger problem is that people don't see God as their creator. We have, uh, in a large part, we have thrown away God as our creator. And so because of that, because there is no creator, then other living beings and other created things are merely objects for us to use. And so when we throw out the Creator, we throw out our connection with other created things and the importance of, of protecting those, those other created things. One of the, shall I say, hallmarks of Pope Francis's encyclicals is that he very clearly says that what he's talking about here is open for dialogue. And this is a very different from other uh, church documents and other encyclicals where when, you know, it was basically, it was just known that when the Pope says something, this is, you know, what we should believe. Although I'm not saying it's infallible, but certainly it's something that we should um, listen to and believe, but Pope Francis has very clearly made it known that what he's writing about here, it's open to debate, it's open to dialogue. Um, in paragraph 188, he says, there are certain environmental issues where it is not easy to achieve a broad consensus. Here I would state once more that the Church does not presume to settle scientific questions or to replace politics. But I am concerned to encourage an honest and open debate so that particular interests or ideologies will not prejudice the common good. Um, in a lot of ways, you can, I mean, it is kind of continuing in some of what um, Pope Benedict had said about, um, you know, the distinctions between church and state, uh, that the church is not to replace the state. Um, but, you know, again, he's saying that, especially with these environmental issues, um, we need to have an open and honest debate about um, what's going on and how to, how to react to them. And so there are basically six chapters within this um, encyclical, and uh, to sum them up in, in one thing. So chapter one is about the care of our, for our common home. He talks about pollution, uh, climate change, uh, the decline of human life and inequality, etc. Chapter 2 is on the gospel of creation, uh, where he talks about the light of faith, uh, the biblical witness, and the common des destination of goods, among other things. Chapter 3 is on human roots of of the human roots of the ecological crisis, where he talks about technology and globalization. Something that's really important to uh, kind of think about there, which is, again, it's building off of what, what Benedict has said with globalization, is uh, the idea of um, uh, developed countries forcing industrialization on developing countries um, without regard for their unique situations and their um, unique society and everything. Um, that we should have these technologies available for them, but we shouldn't force it on them, that they should be able to make their own uh, decisions. Uh, chapter four is on ecology. Chapter five is on action, the dialogue in the scientific community, uh, dialogue in politics, and dialogue between religion and science. And then chapter six is on ecological education and spirituality.
It's always, it, it, he recognizes, and this is why he talked about the uh, church and the state. It's, the environment is especially today a very political um, topic. It can be a very political topic. Um, and so I think he's trying to provide a uh, religious response to some of the known uh, or believed uh, environmental issues uh, without providing a uh, ideological or political um, stance. And so we need to, as church, and so I'm talking about me, steer clear of political sides on the environmental issue and just focus on the religious sides. So this is me getting ahead of you and saying, do not ask me any questions that are political in nature, because I won't answer them. <laughs> so don't ask me my opinion on environmental issues is what I'm saying. Because it's my opinion, and it's not has, doesn't have anything to do with um, the religious side. Yes. Um, by him talking about um, the ecology and mm -hmm. the environment, isn't that being political? Because it is. It's not worldwide mm -hmm. acceptance. There are some that are mm -hmm. on one side, some on the other side. Right. Which is why he has this caveat that I, that I read, which is to say that, um, you know, I'll, as he says, um, certain environmental issues, uh, it is not easy to achieve, achieve a broad consensus. And so that's where uh, we need to have an open and honest debate. So he's presenting uh, kind of an overview and saying these are issues that we need to think about. Um, but he's also saying, you know, there is a, an open discussion going on. I, I kind of see him discussing it more so than it should be. Mm -hmm. So that's why I see it more as a slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll go on. This is where I will not, <laughs> I'm not going to go any further. <laughs> Oh, um, so an encyclical um, is a, an official document from the Pope uh, that is written to uh, a group of people on a particular issue. Um, most of the time it's written to bishops. It can, they can be written to particular bishops. Uh, we haven't really seen that in recent years, but like back in the 19th century, there were a lot of encyclicals that were written to, like, for instance, the bishops of Italy or the bishops of Germany, um, kind of dealing with the situations that are going on there. Um, there is um, a slight uh, hierarchy of, like, so there's encyclicals and apostolic letters and uh, bulls and other things, and there's like, a hierarchy of where they are as far as like the strength behind them. And so encyclicals would be the uh, most formal and strongest uh, documents written by a pope. It always kind of starts off with, you know, who it is written to, um, and then kind of like goes from there. But most of, the, most of them today, are written either to the bishops or to the faithful. They're not really written to specific people or groups of people. That would be more in the letters now, apostolic letters. And a lot of it, to be honest, is kind of semantics. Uh, the distinction between encyclical and letter has been kind of faded, uh, but we still kind of, so like, Pope Francis has written a lot more apostolic letters, which I didn't get into. Uh, I, I just, because it, otherwise it's going to be this huge thing, right? So I decided just to focus on his encyclicals. But in some ways, his letters are even more, well, that's, they're as influential. 
influential. Um, I could say controversial as his encyclicals. So, yeah. And like I said, it's, it's interesting because his letters are longer than any any of Pope Benedict's encyclicals. So it's just it's interesting how the anyways. I don't think I went into that distinction because I think for most people that distinction isn't important. Um, it's more or less a church thing. Yeah. Any other questions about Laudato Si? I think I can say that this is probably the most controversial thing that he's written. Um, well, <laughs> um, well, he has this letter on um, marriage and love, which has certainly um, had some big controversy behind it. But that's actually why I made the distinction, because I didn't want to talk about that one. <laughs> okay, so the last one, uh, just uh, a couple of years ago, less than two years ago, Ritali Tutti. Again, this is Italian and means all the brothers. This is from a, uh, a, a letter that St. Francis wrote, um, which he quotes at the beginning. And this is again October 3rd, 2020. Um, the main overall uh, viewpoint of this is the need for global fraternity and solidarity. And this is especially um, a reaction to COVID-19. Um, which is never controversial, so we're, we're on a good footing, right? Um, he talks about how, uh, especially with, um, and again, I mean, this is written in October 2020, so this is like right in the middle of kind of the height of, of COVID. Um, he talks about how um, this has brought forth uh, the problem that uh, as humans, we're all in this together, but there's no roadmap. Like nobody has, uh, has written out a roadmap for, for how to how to go forward uh, in a increasingly um, global world, uh, in an increasingly small world. And um, so, what does he say? He says that we have to approach uh, global fraternity and solidarity. Uh, with human dignity. He also says that we must not sow seeds of fear. And he focuses a lot, a, a big section on the parable of the Good Samaritan. Uh, and especially this idea that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think he kind of provide, he presents the Good Samaritan as kind of the parable par excellence of Jesus and his mission. Uh, to love our neighbor as ourself. And he talks about how our goal should be an open world without borders. I can feel the, yeah, I know, I can feel the hackles. <laughs> what he's really talking about here is um, that we need to love each other without borders and restrictions. So in other words, um, we need to always remember that other humans, and it doesn't matter what country they're from, uh, we are all brothers and sisters, we are all sons and daughters of God, and we have to look at each other first as sons and daughters of God before we see somebody as other. And so we need to love each other as sons and daughters of God first. And if we do that, then the distinctions between, you know, American and wherever is not that important uh, in relationship. He talks about the failures of current political forms, and he goes into all of them. Uh, and the need for fruitfulness over results. And this is hearkening back to something that I've been said before um, about 
uh, the problems of focusing on uh, results and uh, profits over human dignity. Um, that we need to look, and we need to focus on human dignity first before um, progress and before profit. And again, the importance of dialogue between different peoples, uh, the need for forgiveness across cultures. Uh, he kind of talks about how, you know, because we're fallen, that war is almost inevitable, although we should avoid it at all costs. Um, in some cases, uh, war and um, struggle is inevitable, uh, but when that the time comes for that, when that ends, we need to be able to forgive others. And he puts a lot of emphasis on religions, on uh, the religions of the world to learn to work together. That doesn't mean that we uh, change our faith, that we water down our faith, um, it just means that we need to work together um, as religious people, as um, followers of God, to work together to build up the solidarity among peoples. Again, that's a very brief overview, because if I go into any more detail, we'll get into more trouble. <laughs> and so, any questions about... Yes? I know it's coming. Yes. Going back to liberation theology, yes. I agree with you that in the 1970s, 1980s, that's when it flourished in Central and South America. Mm -hmm. But I think it has its roots in the 1960s mm -hmm. with uh, wars of national liberation. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was a lot of uh, evil throughout the world. I mean, what I mean by Pope Francis didn't write a lot, I mean, as far as I can tell, there's only one book that he wrote before he was elected Pope. Uh, that's not to say that he didn't write other things. Um, certainly as a bishop, he would have written, um, you know, things to the people and, and, you know, stuff like that, as any bishop does. But he didn't write, as far as I can tell, or as far as I remember, he didn't write like books, which is, I was just drawing a distinction between like Pope Benedict XVI, who was very scholarly, and he wrote a lot of stuff, and, whereas Pope uh, Francis did. Um, I just have one other thought. Mm -hmm. The goal of the Open World is borders? Yes. George Soros has kind of loved it. I mean, I think that we always have to keep in mind um, that that's kind of like the, the idea of the world without borders, again, is coming from the mindset of um, primarily loving all humans as humans. Um, but the church, I mean, if you read, you know, in the Second Vatican Council, it talks about um, I can't, I can't remember if it uses the word necessity, but it certainly talks about the reality of borders and cultures and different countries. And it talks about, you know, the need for defense of borders and, you know, the defense of, of your homeland. Um, and so I don't, I'm not saying, I'm not saying that he's going against that. It's merely, it, it's more of the, that idea again of the global humanity. <laughs> now you could go and read this and say, no, he actually says no borders. I don't think he does, but yeah. Does this idea on the income come from the fact that he's a Jesuit? Because I. Yes. Give a 
qualifying us for that. I mean, he is, um, so his theology is very much Jesuit. Uh, I mean, that's where he was trained. He was, he was the um, head of the Jesuits for a while. Um, so, I mean, I, mean that, I don't think that that would be questioned by anybody. Um, I think the other thing to remember, uh, and I don't know if, if people really understand this, but his uh, training uh, in Argentina, when he was growing up, um, the overwhelming philosophy was a philosophy of dialogue. Uh, it was a philosophy of um, trying to avoid absolutes, uh, to allow for differences in opinion. And so that's why a lot of what he writes, as I kind of said, um, allows for dialogue, because that's his philosophy. Um, now, for a lot of people, that becomes difficult. Um, and I'm not here to say one is better than the other. It's just understanding his philosophy, that he has uh, it, he's very different from, say, John Paul II or Benedict, where they were very German, which is, I mean, John Paul II was Polish, but, you know, same kind of thing. Where it's very like, you know, this is, this is the way it is. Um, but that's not Pope Francis, so it's a very different mindset. I think uh, he tries to through his writing and keeping up with the changes in the mm -hmm. world and what's going mm -hmm. on. Right. That's, you know, but keeping an open dialogue right. in the process. Right. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's always that problem of talking about current topics is that you're right in the middle of it. So you don't really have a perspective of being able to look back and say, this was right, this was wrong. Uh, when you're in the middle of something, you're always going to have your biases and your point of view, uh, but you don't have the long picture, which is again why I did this today of just kind of presenting like an overview, because we don't have the perspective. Any other questions? Well, again, thank you for uh, coming all of these Wednesdays for supporting me. Um, and we'll see what we might go from, from here. Uh, but for the time being, I'm not doing any more talks because I need a break. Um, I wanted to end with the concluding prayer from uh, Lumen Fide. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Mother, help our faith. Open our ears to hear God's word and to recognize his voice and call. Awaken in us a desire to follow in his footsteps, to go forth from our own land and to receive his promise. Help us to be touched by his love, that we may touch him in faith. Help us to entrust ourselves fully to him and to believe in his love, especially at times of trial, beneath the shadow of the cross, when our faith is called to mature. So in our faith the joy of the risen one, Remind us that those who believe are never alone. Teach us to see all things with the eyes of Jesus, that he may be light for our path. And may this light of faith always increase in us until the dawn of that undying day, which is Christ himself, your Son, our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.